right, chapter three. We fought daily, Kevin and I. My main job as producer was to recruit people for the hot seat. After I signed someone up, Kevin began researching the, the person, getting his questions ready. Every day he asked me, did you sign her up? Every day I answered no. He got frustrated. What do you mean no? Don't you want her to sign up? I told him I wasn't sure. His eyes bugged out. Not sure? How can he not be so sure? We high-fived in the lunchroom five weeks ago. We were thinking Stargirl miniseries even. This is a hot seat from heaven. I shrugged. Well, that was then. Now I'm not so sure. He looked at me like I had three ears. What's there not to be sure about? I shrugged. Well then, he said, I'll sign her up. He walked away. You'll have to find another director then, I said. He stopped. I could almost see the steam rising from his shoulders. He turned, pointed. Leah, you can be a real jerk sometimes. He walked off. It was uncomfortable. Kevin Quillen and I usually agreed on everything. We had been best friends since arriving in Arizona the same week four years before. We both thought that prickly pear cactus looked like ping pong paddles with whiskers and that saguaro cactus looked like dinosaur mittens. We both loved strawberry banana smoothies. We both wanted to go into television. Kevin often said he wanted to be a sleazy talk show host and he wasn't kidding. I wanted to be a sports announcer or news anchor. We conceived Hot Seat together and convinced the faculty to let us do it. It was an instant hit. It quickly became the most popular thing in school. So why was I doing this? I didn't know. I had some vague feelings, but the only one I could identify was a warning. Leave her alone. In time, Hillary's hypothesis, so-called by Kevin, about Stargirl's origins gave way to other theories. Stargirl was trying to get herself discovered for the movies. She was sniffing fumes. She was homeschooling gone crazy. She was an alien. The rat she brought to school was only the tip of the iceberg. She had hundreds of them at home, some as big as cats. She lived in a ghost town in the desert. She lived in a bus. Her parents were circus acrobats. Her parents were witches. Her parents were brain dead vegetables in a hospital in Yuma. We watched her sit down in class and pull from her canvas bag a blue and yellow ruffled curtain that she draped over three sides of her desk. We saw her set out a three inch clear glass vase and drop it and drop into it a white and yellow daisy. She did and undid this in every class she attended six times a day. Only on Monday mornings was the daisy fresh. By last period, the petals were drooping. By Wednesday, the petals began to fall and the stem began to sag. By Friday, the flower hung down over the rim of the waterless vase, its dead stump of a head shedding yellow dust in the pencil groove. We joined her as she sang happy birthday to us in the lunchroom. We heard her greet us in the hallways and classrooms, and we wondered how she knew our names and our birthdays. Her caught in the headlights eyes gave her a look of perpetual astonishment, so that we found ourselves turning red turning and looking back over our shoulders, wondering what we were missing. She laughed when there was no joke. She danced when there was no music. She had no friends, yet she was the friendliest person in school. In her answers in class, she often spoke of seahorses and stars, but she didn't even know what football was. She said there was no TV in her house. She was elusive. She was today. She was tomorrow. She was the faintest scent of a cactus flower, the flitting shadow of an elf owl. We did not know what to make of her. In our minds, we tried to pin her to a cork board like a butterfly, but the pin merely went through and away she flew. Kevin wasn't the only one. Other kids bothered me. Put her on the hot seat. I lied. I said she was only a 10th grader and you had to be at least a junior to be on the hot seat. Meanwhile, I kept my distance. I observed her as if she were a bird in an aviary. One day I turned a corner and there she was, coming right at me, the long skirt softly rustling, looking straight at me, surrounding me with those eyes. I turned and I trotted off the other way. Seating myself in my next class, I felt warm, shaken. I wondered if my foolishness showed. Was I becoming goofy? The feeling I had had when I saw her around the corner had been something like panic. Then one day after school, I followed her. I kept at a safe distance. Since she was known not to take the bus, I expected the walk to be short. 
but it was it wasn't. We trekked all over Micah, past hundreds of grassless stone and cactus front yards, through the Tudorai shopping center, skirting the electronics business park around which the city had been invented a mere 15 years before. At one point, she pulled a piece of paper from her bag. She consulted it. She seemed to be reading house numbers as she went along. Abruptly, she turned up a driveway, went to the front door, and left something in the mailbox. I waited for her to move off. I looked around, no one on the street. I went to the mailbox, pulled out a homemade card, opened it. Each tall letter was a different painted color. The card said, congratulations. It was unsigned. I resumed following her. Cars pulled into driveways. It was dinner time. My parents would be wondering where I was. She took the rat from the bag and put it on her shoulder. Riding there, the rat faced backwards, its tiny triangular face peeping out of her sand-colored hair. I could not see its beady black eyes, but I guessed it was looking at me. I fancied it was telling her what it saw. I fell further back. Shadows crossed the streets. We passed the car wash and the bike shop. We passed the country club golf course, the biggest spread of green grass until the next golf course in the next town. We passed the welcome to Micah sign. We were walking westward. There was us and the highway and the desert and the sun blazing above the Maricopa Mountains. I wish I had my sunglasses. After a while, she veered from the highway. I hesitated, but I kept following her. She was walking directly into the setting sun, now a great orange perched atop the mountain crests. For a minute, the mountains were the same dusky lavender as her sand skimming sh skirt. With every step, the silence grew, as did my sense that she knew, had known all along, that she was being followed, or more, that she was leading me somewhere. She never looked back. She strummed her ukulele. She sang. I could no longer see the rat. I imagined it was dozing in the curtain of her hair. I imagined her rat was singing along. The sun lay down behind the mountains. Where was she going? In the gathering dust, the saguaro flung shadows of giants across the pebbled earth. The air was cool in my face. The desert smelled of apples. I heard something, a coyote. I thought of rattlesnakes and scorpions. I stopped. I watched her walk on. I stifled an impulse to call after her to warn her. But of what? I turned and I walked, then ran back to the highway. Chapter four. At Micah Area High School, Hillary Kimball was famous for three things. Her mouth, the hoax, and Wayne Parr. Her mouth spoke for itself, most often to complain. The episode that became known as Hillary's Hoax took place in her sophomore year, where she tried out for cheerleading. Her face and her hair and her figure were right enough, and she surely had the mouth. She made the squad easily. And then she stunned everyone by turning it down. She said she just wanted to prove that she could do it. She said she had no intention of yammering and bouncing in front of empty bleachers, which was usually the case. And anyways, she hated sports. As for Wayne Parr, he was her boyfriend. Mouthwise, he was her opposite. He seldom opened his mouth. He didn't have to. All he had to do was appear. That was his job, appear. By both boys and girl standards, Wayne Parr was gorgeous. But he was more and less than that. In terms of achievement, Wayne Parr seemed to be nobody. He played on no sports team, joined no organization, he won no awards, he earned no A's. He was elected to nothing, honored for nothing. And yet, though it did not re I did not realize this until years later, he was the grand marshal of our daily parade. We did not wake up in the morning and ask ourselves, what will Wayne Parr wear today? Or how will Wayne Parr act today? At least not consciously but on some level below awareness, that is exactly what we did. Wayne Parr did not go to football and basketball games and by and large, neither did we. Wayne Parr did not ask questions in class or get worked up over teachers or pep rallies and neither did we. Wayne Parr did not much care and neither did we. Did Parr create us or was he simply a reflection of us? I didn't know. I knew only that if you peeled off one by one all the layers of the student body, you would have found at the core, not the spirit of the school, but Wayne Parr. That's why in our sophomore year, I had recruited Parr for the hot seat. Kevin was surprised. Well, why him, Kevin said, what's he ever done? What could I say? 
that Parr was a worthy subject precisely because he did nothing, because he was so monumentally good at doing nothing. I had only a vague insight, not the words. I just shrugged. The highlight of that hot seat came when Kevin asked Parr who was his hero, his role model. It was one of Kevin's standard questions. Parr answered, GQ. In the control room, I did a double take. Was the sound working right? GQ, Kevin repeated dumbly. Gentleman's Quarterly, the magazine? Parr did not look at Kevin. He looked straight at the camera. He nodded smugly. He went on to say he wanted to become a male model. His ultimate ambition was to be on the cover of GQ magazine. And right there, he posed for the camera. He had that disdainful model look down pat. And suddenly I could see it. The jaw square as the corner of a cover, the chiseled cheeks, the perfect teeth and hair. That, as I say, took place towards the end of our sophomore year. I thought then that Wayne Parr would always reign as our Grand Marshal. How could I have known that he would soon be challenged by a freckle-nosed homeschooler? Okay, guys, that's the end of Chapter 4. I hope you guys enjoyed these chapters of the book by Jerry Spinelli, Stargirl. Um, if you have any questions, or you guys want to do like a class discussion or a post on Teams, just let me know and we can create that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.